Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki. I'm very excited to still be doing interviews at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Eric Anderson. Hello. Hey. Thanks for coming out of the show. Yeah, totally. Really appreciate it. I'm very excited to talk. We have, a, we have a lot to discuss. Eric's background is crazy. He has been doing, he, he's now the principal of Scale Venture Partners for the last one and a half years. They have a $400 million fund that's been making investments into everything from cybersecurity to developer tools to open source technologies to now engineering software. So we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be talking about his journey, how he got here. Let's start with that. Who are you? How did you become who you are today? What were these major influences on your life? Uh, I so I I like to build things. Maybe we'll start there. Yeah. Or and and as a kid, I loved science. Um, maybe the best way to visualize that, I, uh, there was a comet when I was younger. Um, I think it was Hale Bop. Do you? I don't know if you remember Hale Bop. Okay. Um, but it, I think it emerged for the first time when I was like. I want to say a twelve or something. I had probably a dozen pictures of Hale Bop and all that's on on my wall. Um, I got a telescope. I was pretty into like science and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that sort of thing. I was supposed to, uh, astronaut was like the plan, and uh, that didn't pan out. I think I was afraid of heights. And uh, anyway, so uh, eventually I, I turned to engineering, and that was kind of what I I wanted to build things and make things. Uh, so the, it's interesting that the influence came with both science and building, but that with you know looking up at at comets or that or that um, as a young kid, the parents were very involved with helping your creative ability flourish. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly I, I like my parents a lot, so I should say yes to that question. <laughs> but um, there was, I was also one of six kids. And oh, you were one of six. Yeah, yeah that's a big deal. I was, the th I was right in the middle, so I don't know that they were paying any particular, particular attention, attention to me. Particular attention, for yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. So they, was six. they helped me. They did get the telescope when I yeah, asked for it. That's great. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that they ever looked at it with me. Um, totally. With yeah. six of them, it's really hard to give attention. Plus, working yeah. to support all this. I mean, I, I should tell my my parents were amazing, and before they see this and think that I didn't give them enough credit. My dad was an amazing listener. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, I felt like I could just like explain everything to him and, I'd, and, and he was a super smart guy. That's great. Got me interested in a lot of things. That's great, that's great. Yeah, the, 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 when, you're, when you have six of them, it makes it definitely a lot more difficult to be able to work and give each one of them really important um, yeah. attention and ability to creatively flourish. Then, you know, how did that lead you to, to Utah and Stanford and Harvard? How did you like pick, go from engineering and building yeah. to, to, to the collegiate route? Where was the, what were you building? Going yeah, so I, I went to the University of Utah, it was my home school and ended up in mechanical engineering just because I couldn't decide between physics and computer science and a couple other things. Um, and I, I mean, the first kind of thing I happened into was I was working with my brother-in-law on this uh, bike that he wanted to build. And I, I knew how to design it from my school work, but he didn't. Um, so I helped him design this bike. Uh, and it, it became like a business for him. And I was like super jazzed about this yeah. idea that we could like um, make something and sell it. Uh, I then, um, so I, I was kind of thought I, would, I didn't want to do engineering in the way I had normally. I don't want to be a designer so much as I want to be like, I want to build companies and, and mm, mm. so that kind of, mm. I, I yeah, then yeah. got excited about um, software a bit and taught myself uh, programming. That was back when apps were cool I, and uh, I had an Android phone so I wanted to learn how to make Android apps when people were only making iPhone apps it seemed. Uh, I actually won a little business pawn contest, small one. Um, for this particular app, and it didn't work. Um, there were some constraints behind it, but uh, it got me excited, and I, it was exciting enough that when I interviewed for this job at Amazon, they thought that what I was building was cool, uh, and it landed me a job at Amazon. Oh, sh wow. Which, which yeah. like, uh, kind of set me on a, a course, I think, towards, like, so I was, I was a product manager in their cloud business, uh, which I didn't know anything about, but I got this email every day that told me how much money they were making in the, in the cloud businesses. And this is before they had reported revenue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, forget my silly app. These guys are printing money. <laughs> money. <laughs> like there's something special here. And I, uh, my manager left and went to Google Cloud. Oh, wow. Um, and I eventually found my way also to Google Cloud yeah. thinking that was kind of the ground floor of something big. Yeah. And I always thought it would be awesome to work at Google. So I was mm -hmm. just excited at the opportunity. 
Uh, and that's where I really learned software. So I was there four and a half years yeah. working with a team of mostly PhDs um, that were doing like distributed processing. Uh, and I would, I would have conversations with them about what we should build next. And then I would go home and just research what, everything they had just, I, I, words I didn't understand, things I didn't get. That's right. Uh, to try and like keep ahead of what was going on. Yeah. Uh, and maybe just to round out the story. so. In the process of that, I, f I felt like, you know, I, I wanted to be a builder, and here I'm working at like Amazon and Google, these big companies. Yeah, yeah. So, I thought maybe it was time for me to look at starting my own company. I was talking to VCs about things I was noticing and things that their startups to try and find a startup, but that actually led to conversations about joining uh, a venture firm. Yeah. So, in the process of trying to find a startup, I ended up at Scale Venture Partners. Yeah, yeah, and it actually makes a, a lot of sense because that when you, you, you've said multiple times that you care a lot about building companies and that versus sometimes a lot of people care about you know just making a design that works really well for a specific aspect of, of a product or a service. And so um, when you're at that end of the abstract spectrum, a, 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 a role in venture capital makes most sense. You, with your background, with your, when you're talking about the bike with your brother-in-law and then the um, figuring this out slowly about yourself as as they're printing money at Amazon and Google, and Microsoft yeah. with their cloud computing services. Right, some crazy stuffs happening um, with what with what that means and how to make sense of data and the application of quantum computing intelligence to that and and um, and other decentralization technologies of the algorithm so that people can actually. Uh, uh, use the right things at the right times when they're not in silos. All these types of aspects are so critical to, to what's happening in the future. And how many years was it total at Amazon and Google then? So Amazon was really brief. I was brief. there for like a summer internship. Summer. Google, Google was four, four and a half years. Four and a half. So almost five years in like yeah, yeah, total, yeah. in total in, in cloud work. And then, and then I love also how you're describing your story that when I do, I do similarly when someone comes onto our show that's at the you know, cutting edge of biotech or neuroscience or blockchain or wherever they're at. You know, what I do is I do similar work as you when they just go off and they're like, but da, 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 all this nuance and, and depth. And then I'm like, all right, I need to go do more homework. I need to go and learn about these yeah. things so I can be more well rounded, be more well spoken, understand future technologies better. So that's, I, I love hearing that. And I hope other people that watch also take that. That that mentality of, of 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 humility and wanting to learn and be open minded and go and and the you know the internet is such a great tool now for you to be able to go and do whatever totally. learning you want yeah yeah okay now as you find yourself if uh, you're like I'll, I want to build I want to build companies you get into scale venture partners now what is that like when you're first introduced from you know from from engineering and from the uh, cloud work that you did all the way into venture capital when you first introduced like baptism what was that like yeah I mean I think uh, there were uh, the, the folks I joined had been at scale for some time and I think they were excited in some ways to have like someone who's coming from industry some fresh ideas so immediately everyone turns to me and is like Eric what should we <laughs> what should we invest in and uh, it's kind of deer in the headlights we're like I mean I I've thought about this to some degree, but I haven't ever put my, you know, um, skin in the game skin in the up game. until this point. Uh, and, and so at first I'm just like, I have no idea. I mean, I'm, I'm unqualified to this answer. But on the other hand, I'm like, well, no, I just spent a bunch of time looking at these companies that I was about to personally invest my time in. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a good, I mean, I was thinking critically about what's going to work there. Um, I floated a few ideas and one I was fairly jazzed about that we looked at pretty closely and, and within like a couple months of being there, the firm had made an investment in a company I was, um, I thought we should. It, like the timing all worked out, like they happened to be raising, um, we had, a, I had an intro to them uh -huh. and, uh, and I felt like I've suddenly hit the ground running. Uh, so that was exciting. Uh, I've since learned it doesn't always work out there. We've yeah, had a lot yeah. of great ideas yeah. and the timing hasn't worked out, but uh, it's been a busy year and a half. Okay, so so what what does what does it look like being the young guy that people are like, what should we invest in? And you're like thinking about what where civilization's moving towards, where you guys can really apply these 
um, you're mostly focused on series A, B, C right. funding. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So these are like bigger rounds. Yeah. Of tens yeah. They, of millions. Companies have like you know uh, double digit employees, and they've got some revenue. Like they build the product and uh, a little bit of revenue. They probably don't have like a sales team yet, but they, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the CEO is doing the selling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of the stage, right? Yes. Okay. And then, so as as this is as this is happening, and you're yeah. having all these, you know, the the other partners asking you, like, well, what are you seeing? Like, right. where are we going? What what are what are your what are your responses to? Yeah. So I think at first I start just regurgitating all the trends that I'm seeing. And which and, ones were those? Uh, I mean, so open source was one. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think. Uh, there, there was there, there's probably a class of investors who don't think it makes sense to give away your product for free, totally, yeah. and and there weren't a lot of ton of, a lot of open source exits up at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, in the year and a half, we've probably seen more open source open exits. source exits of open source companies than, than before. Than before, I mean, before wow. there was just a handful. Uh, Damn, and, that's great. And so, yeah, so that was like one thing um, that I felt like was happening. But I, I think I hadn't, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of regurgitating these trends, like open source is a thing, and um, you know, serverless, you know, a, a cloud infrastructure, approach to cloud infrastructure that makes it, you don't have to think about the servers is kind of a thing. And as I'm regurgitating these, I think I'm realizing that I haven't thought about them the way kind of VCs do in some ways. Mm -hmm. Like I hadn't, I hadn't really figured out, uh, are these defensible markets, are these big markets? I was just kind of rattling off the trends I saw my mm -hmm. friends were excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think quickly I started to try and look at them through a new angle, which was like, okay, so w which ones can you actually make money in? And uh, I found that generally the, th the things my friends were excited about were actually um, good, you know, good investment areas, but maybe not always the case. And then well, when when you're when you're looking at um, like the new aspects of these of these ideas, you're looking at you said like defensibility. You're looking at scalability, market size, all these new ways of also perceiving um, the cutting edge technologies. It that that adds another lens to your to your kind of tool belt of right, seeing the right. world, and that 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 makes it in a way it makes you more well rounded. It makes you able to to see things in a in a and when when you're listing you're listing these different fields you know you, you open source the amount of exits that are more, were more in the last year and a half which to me that sounds very interesting because I'm trying to figure out you know how can we move towards that like open notebook science yeah, yeah, right. side of yeah, things yeah very good yeah yeah and then and then there's that and then there's also the the you know what was the other the second one that you mentioned a uh, serverless serverless like what was so 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 when a company wants to, you know, to to not have to build their own data centers, they just use Amazon, right. or Google. So, but how does Google or Amazon become serverless? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So server, it's a okay. silly phrase, but when you okay. use Google or Amazon, you're still making a lot of decisions when you interact with Google or Amazon. You're saying, I want a server about this size, a, a virtual machine, and I want it to uh, have, you know, this much RAM, this much memory. And uh, when I say I'm ready, it's going to take about 90 seconds to become available. That's crazy. And, and, and it's going to, yeah, you know, which is crazy fast, right? And then it's going to charge me while it's on for the next year until I turn it off. Yeah, yeah. And um, once you start building services on top of these things, you're like, well, if, if I don't, you know, why doesn't it? Why doesn't the server automatically turn off when I'm not using it? Ah. And can't we spin it up a little bit faster? And eventually, if you think that way, you arrive at the point of like, why don't you just charge me every time I need? The, the moment I need the server for yeah. just that moment. Correct, for the and computation. For the computation. Yeah. So if I have a little website that, um, you know, uh, looks up uh, license plate numbers, I don't know what it would do. At the moment I, I send the license plate number and it returns the answer, I just pay for that moment of computation. I don't have to tell you how big a machine I want. You know, the, the more requests I make, it should just like yeah, yeah. become Charge you uh, more charge money. me more money, and it should scale to fit my yeah, needs, and, needs, and yeah. that, that's kind yeah. of the notion behind serverless. Is okay. no config, no to specify things, and there's no oh um, okay. time spent spinning up or spinning down. Okay, got it, got it. So basically, no there's still servers out there. Yeah, yeah, but you're not yeah. thinking in, the, in terms of servers. That's what serverless. Okay, okay. cool. That's a, okay. <sighs> it, interesting. So no config is potentially a better way to do yeah, it. Sure. It's kind of yeah. like at, at at as you need computation, you're just 
you're just passing along the computation to the cloud right. and having that um, that cost come back uh, right. for you. But so um, if no one uses data. your product, you don't pay Amazon any money. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So and that and then that that saves lots of time because otherwise the time setting up config. Uh, yeah, and the and the time that it's on when you're not using it, uh, all this all this other kind right. of stuff. Interesting. So that was the second one, and then you've also been focused a lot on cybersecurity. Yeah, and that was a bit incidental. Um, I mean, I don't I don't think um, actually security and privacy is more top of mind for everyday folks, but. We, um, we just had a Nebula Genomics uh, CEO on our show, okay. and and the the amount of, of genomic um, uh, uh, data that the number one reason that people are uh, holding themselves back from um, from adding their 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 genomic data into uh, um, into f for the masses on medical research yeah. and all this type of stuff is because of the, the privacy issue that that um, are what, what is the government involvement what is the um, what is insurance involvement what is the um, who's, who's who's monetizing on this data mm -hmm. um, do I actually own it who owns it right it's all these questions uh, that so the pri yeah Privacy in so many ways has bubbled up to become this um, this extremely massive issue. But what are you actually hiding? Should it go the way of China? Should it go a global surveillance? Should it go you know? There's all, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I can go off, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, similarly, I mean, uh, when I first started, we were, we were doing a deep dive on kind of GDPR at the time, and which is the kind of European privacy policy that uh, is probably the biggest of its of our time, and we were looking for investments that could help people satisfy. GDPR requirements. Meanwhile, um, there was a ton of cybersecurity investments that I that was just kind of coming into the door. That, and, the, and the more time I spent with them, the more I thought, you know, I've, I've, I know actually a fair amount of what goes on with computer networks and uh, how these. So, so even though I didn't have security background, suddenly I felt like this was an interesting area that I could weigh in on that I was kind of forced to get smart on. And since then, uh, in the first year of being at scale, we did. I, have, I helped with four security investments, um, where I'm now a board observer. So I'm, you know, at the company every quarter helping build the business. Mm -hmm. It's been like now. I, this is one of the areas I'm most excited about. In that you're going to do the most homework. That right. you, yeah, you, yes. you, you've assigned yourself <laughs> tons of homework to go exactly. do through this process, yeah. so that you can be at the edge when the when the founders of these companies are talking to you about what they're building. You can relate with them, and right. you Can and help be that that you're hitting the tennis ball back in interesting ways for them to build their yeah. business. I mean, ultimately, they're looking for me to be a contributor. Yeah, correct. Yeah, to the business, and, you know, uh, and so I have to do my homework, but I'll, but also there's. After you you help three or four of the companies in security, you start to see that uh, you know here's here's a great VP of sales and here's a great sales yeah. process and yeah, yeah, um, totally. and, and you know so it it ends up um, the experience I've had in the past year has been super helpful and right. that founders seem to be yeah. getting excited about. Now, now teach us about what these new cybersecurity investments have to do with data and privacy. Yeah. And it, it may be more properly labeled like security, privacy, compliance, but okay. um, what, what we found is that when uh, the companies often have like a privacy officer, somebody who's kind of on point for privacy, but they don't often have the budget or the um, organizational kind of influence that the security team has. The security team has been at companies for now a decade, has a lot of budget, a lot of influence. And, and their goals are fairly aligned. Like securing data is very related to, to ensuring privacy compliance mm -hmm. on that data. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we're finding is that as we, you know, as we s selling privacy software almost all, often ends up coming, drawing from security budget and, oh. the, and the security leader becomes the stakeholder in the conversation. Mm. And I, I see privacy companies kind of expanding into security, and security companies kind of expanding into privacy. Interesting. So yeah, it may it may be something that consolidates to some degree with time. Yeah, and you had that at the very beginning. You said you know it's a security privacy that you're the, that that, right. that that is coming together. Now, when when it comes to securing data, companies that are aiming to secure data, they're complying with privacy regulations. Um, that's usually happening through cryptography is the process. Often, yeah. Okay. And then the the greater degree of cryptography, the greater degree of privacy. But then there's also this process of wanting to make sure that if 
the owner of the data wants for the data to flow, yep. it's easy to open these valves and let the data flow. So that's is that part of the yeah. I mean the. the the types of regulations, the compliance that we're looking at initially is mostly around things like if you have a breach and customer data is compromised, you need to notify the customer. This is, you know, Europe says this is how it should work and it and seems like the right preferably way. Preferably you even have the, the, the these co-centric circles that prevent, you get yeah. notifications prior to. Yeah, you should yeah. You should prevent breach yes, and in, yes. the, in the case of breach it should be kind of limited in scope yes, yes. And, in, and people should be notified immediately. Um, Another kind of compliance regulation is if somebody requests to be forgotten or, or oh, kind of yeah. removed from a database, right, they yeah. should have the right to, to be done so. <laughs> yeah. And for, for a lot of organizations, like no one, no one's uh, thought to do that before or has the capability to do that before. And if uh, responding in an automated fashion, in an efficient fashion to somebody's request um, requires a change in how they tool their systems. So a lot of the Kind of initial investments we were looking at are like how do how do we satisfy those requirements for companies that are now immediately required to, to do this. Um, long term, it's how do we keep the data out of, from the bad guys. But for the, in the near term, it's how do you comply with the regulation? Yeah, yeah. And just a quick bit on your on your perspective on the on the future regarding this. Does it look like a, a global surveillance is where we're heading? Does it look like a complete transparency on all things is where we're heading? I mean, I like to think a lot if we spiritually advanced ourselves as a society, we could more quickly eradicate malevolence and not even have to worry yeah. about some of these issues that we have with with trust. Yeah. So where where do you where do you see that the the the, the state of Privacy and data. Yeah, right. it's uh, it's it's ultimately up to I think the um, people's uh, it, how like if we don't get excited and demand privacy policy from either our governments or our company or our you know companies that provide you know provide us services, we're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. Like I think there's mm -hmm. there's power in data, and uh, for big tech companies, they, they, they wield more mar market power and have more revenue potential with more data. Um, is there something to really be private about? This is an important thing. Is, yeah. is, like, you asked me kind of personally, like, should we be worried about privacy? It, like, because as a, just a thought experiment, yeah. right? Yeah. If, there, if we could spiritually advance, there's no malevolence. Yeah. What do we really need to hide? Right. Yeah, yeah. So then, what would be the point of all the cryptography and all of the yeah, yeah. restricted data flows and and the potentially open up even our ability to move around the world with more ease when yeah. there's no malevolence? It's just these are very yeah. important things to unlock. Yeah, but assuming a, a world with good intentions, good right, actors. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there, you know, it's an interesting thought experiment to consider why we need privacy. Uh, I mean, I don't know that it's for me to say, like, I don't know that, um, it's, it's an interesting counter question to say, does, do people have a right to privacy, whether or not they can articulate why they want it? Yeah. Um, and should we feel obligated to satisfy their, their yeah. kind of yeah. request for privacy? Sure. On the other hand, um, we certainly, uh, we haven't really asked ourselves these questions yet, like pr um, home ownership in the United States is largely public. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's all on the mm -hmm. titles and the deeds, and you can look it up, but most people don't. And I don't think people realize that, like, their names and addresses and sometimes phone numbers are attached on a public record to, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and who owns vehicles is largely public today. Uh, in some ways, I think I would love if a world where we treated social security numbers as public, because the fact that we pretend that they're private, but they're often leaked, yeah. makes, it, makes it a tricky place to live. Operate. The personal genome project, people just post their genomes completely on all six billion yeah. bases, just right on the yeah. free space. So, um, so this is these are this these transparent, you know, your deeds to your houses, your, yeah. your cars. Yeah. yeah, these are these are very interesting times to, to explore thought experiments like this and how to um, how to get rid of some of the the. the the bad behavior, some of the bad intent that um, that exists to, to make it easier to live in that in that trust-filled environment. I want to ask about uh, engineering software. Sure. So, yeah. So, what about skill interest in? I think. Um, I mean, we don't have a, like a bunch of historic investments there. It's a, it's a smaller kind of venture market than what we um, have historically worked yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. But. Um, 
part of your job is not to just keep investing in the same areas because there's always new opportunities. And I think there's a kind of emerging opportunity in engineering software. Yes. Uh, yes. Between additive manufacturing and, and its couple technology of generative design, uh, as well as kind of what I spoke at COFAS today was about how there's a pattern of automation yeah. in building software, and I think we're seeing automation in yeah. building yeah. 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 hardware. Anyway, all that comes together to think like there could be some really big companies Huge. here and yeah. in, in places that uh, we haven't normally expected to see them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the one's ability to do uh, yeah, engineering simulations, the, the, the permutational capability of artificial intelligence um, just is vastly superior to our human uh, in computational ability to see yeah. the fit, how functional can we make a piece right. in that space. Um, and that doing that over and over again for pieces to fit into it a whole, um, that generative design and additive manufacturing, that, that this is a very, the, an interesting way to think about how um, a general intelligence could potentially be able to make more of yeah. itself and and uh, in ways that humans are are become a little bit le uh, are just oh, not uh, even potentially can just become more yeah I don't know we don't like using the word irrelevant but uh, yeah it's uh, human capital becomes it's a complicated it's a very very complicated yeah. thing it's kind of like a little bit of passing the torch to a to a general intelligence, it's a it's a very complicated thing. But I'm glad that you're watching this uh, this well. This I, area. One, th one thing we found with we've seen automation come in business software and in kind of our research. Um, it, it not not to touch on push button issues, but like it, what's nice is that a lot of people a lot of these jobs aren't that appreciated. I mean, like re very repetitious jobs that can be yeah. automated by kind of rudimentary artificial intelligence are not the most enjoyable jobs. Lack of meaning and purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And But um, I think what, anyway, not to delve too much into policy, but we, we should also, it, at the same time we're automating rudimentary things, we should look to... to Retrain for all the beautiful right. new things. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of the hundred plus million jobs that are being yeah. created, but the to, to get people into those slots yeah. is a whole complicated shebang that we need, you know, augmented reality and really these personal AI learning systems that are like literally no Alan's capability yeah. in biology and they're really working with me on understanding where I'm at and helping me get, yeah. get to the point where I become very relevant in the synthetic biology world, that type of stuff. That is that, that That's where you feel as well as that we're, we're, we're moving potentially away from some of the, with the crosshairs of software and the repetition work and moving towards the, the new creative um, gigs, but that we have this gap that we need to get through of the, re, of the training for those, those gigs. Do you feel similar? Yeah, I, 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 uh, I mean, I don't want to, like, I don't have a strong opinion one way or another on, on what that future looks like, yeah, yeah. but I, I do think that everyone has, I, to some degree, an innate desire to create. I mean, I certainly did younger. I do now. Yeah. And I, everyone I feel like I talk to has has similar feelings. It feels a bit human yeah. to want to create, yes. Um, yes. and and not just do repetitious actions. And I, I'd love both to see both children it. and creative designs. It's yeah, like yeah. Creative yeah, there you kids go. too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'd love to see a um, a way in which more you know society in which more people get the opportunity to, to really create. That, that's, that would be awesome. Yeah, it's like the, the unlocking of the creative potential of a human mind as well, because it's yeah. kind of stuck sometimes in, in repetitive, maybe more um, uh, meaningless or, or, uh, or less purposeful work. And how about we talk a bit on, you know, this is, this is crazy that this is a, you know, a, 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 a $400 million fund is, is massive, but it takes a long time to build up enough trust to be able to, to, um, to, to, to to take in that much um, funding to be able to go and, and, and make and make really good investments, then with this, where do you where are you seeing your time and 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 the the time of scale venture partners being invested into the future of technology? Where's our focus going to be? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah where yeah. is the main focus is that you're feeling out? 
Yeah, so we, uh, we've historically spent most of our time in you know, what we call business software, enterprise software. Um, and I, I, in, the, in the last year or so, we've dabbled in what you, know, what you might call frontier markets. We've done some robotics. Um, but I don't think we want to move too much from our core of, of uh, business software. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's easy to kind of think a lot about the future and uh, not realize that most people today have fairly um, you know, mundane nine to five lives and there's a plenty, plenty of opportunity to make people more productive, to, uh, to make businesses more efficient. Yes, totally, um, totally. With, with, with even just kind of nuts and bolts software, but also, um, yeah. Artificial intelligence, I think, is uh, certainly. I mean, if I had a couple kind of like within business software yeah. where we're going to look, it's is vertical software. Like uh, instead of just horizontal tools, like everyone needs a CRM to manage customer data. What, you know, what about for like the construction industry uh, place that's probably under invested in software today? Yeah. You know, what what do software solutions look like there? Real estate, healthcare. Yes, so I think yes. I think you know the the. Um, vertical specific business software is really interesting. Interesting. And then um, yeah. machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, can't be overstated, but probably is overstated. You know, it's, it's, we talk a lot about it. Uh, we're we're interested in areas um, I think uniquely served by neural networks. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy to get excited about machine learning in general. Machine learning has actually been around for a bit, mm -hmm. and I think the the most recent advancement is. Uh, language interpretation, uh, computer vision. Mm -hmm. So I think areas that touch on yeah, yeah. Uh, natural language and, and computer vision are, are interesting in vertical markets and horizontal markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good that you're you're going into looking at healthcare and and real estate and construction. These are also just massive fields that are probably, like you said, um, they don't have as much of the of the artificial intelligence attention being placed on yeah. them. And there's there's a lot of, of, of like you said, work that can be uh, enhanced by artificial intelligence yeah. in, the, in those in those spaces. So it's good that you're doing that. This has been a lot of fun. I want to um, ask you, what would you say is, a, is an important skill set for, for, for kids and for adults in the moving into the 21st century to learn? So, uh, my sales, I might jokingly kind of say, but like mm. the sales, mm. the broader mm. you know thing of sales is just um, communicating. Uh, I think communication is uh, something we're getting worse at. At the same time, we're getting better at so many other things. You know, we don't talk to people, we don't form relationships in the same way. Um, most software is still adopted through, uh, at least under you know, commercial software is through sales. Um, all of my work is, is more or less sales. Yeah. You know, I'm either being sold to or I'm selling. And, uh, and yet, I think we've, we've kind of structured the way people uh, you know, think about training themselves is mostly around skills. And, and those are kind of often very kind of uh, tactical skills, about <clears throat> number crunching, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Steve Jobs is maybe like the most famous innovator uh, of our time, and it's not because he was like great at machine learning um, or anything. He was just incredible at communicating yeah, yeah. Uh, his vision to people. Yeah, yeah. yeah th this is such a profound end to this conversation that the better we can get at taking this crazy human experience that we're living, synthesizing it into a really powerful story that we can teach yeah. other people and sell them on the idea of our mental map that we're trying to replace the old map of code right. of civilization with some new code that people can really get behind. That that, that skill is so critical. Because it's funny, because when we just had, you know, Greg Brockman on the show, um, co-founder at OpenAI, that when, when his, what his skill yeah that he recommended, yeah. everyone needs to know how to program. Yeah. And you're like, everyone needs to know how to sell their vision. Yeah. And so these two things kind of go hand in hand, really, right. is one's ability to understand the, the fundamentals of code along with the fundamentals of human connection yeah. and rapport and love and compassion that go hand in hand. Yeah. yeah. 
it's so interesting the way that these these conversations end up going out. Eric, this has been so fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on to the show hey, and teaching us hey, about thank what you. you're working on. Thank you. It's a good time. Uh, I'm glad, glad you had a good time. It's very important to us. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and have more conversations with people around you about what it's like to invest into cutting-edge technologies and have more conversations around these topics. Also, Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Go and check out the links below to Eric's work, the links to Kofez, and our links as simulation as well. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you soon, everyone. Peace.